Today we're at a place called Sunken Lane, just outside of Beaumont Hamel, where the two sides, British and German, faced off on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. The German front line came down from Serre, where we were in the previous video that I did about Horace Isles, and came down past the front here of Beaumont Hamel and then bulged out up here at Hawthorne Ridge. Up there, the German 119th Infantry Regiment had been set up for about 18 months. They were well dug in, strong defences. Across the other side of no man's land, the British 29th Division. So to just get your bearings a little bit here, kind of over sort of where this tree line is behind me. This is roughly where the German front line would have been. It would have come up here and you can see those trees up at the top of the hill up here. This is Hawthorne Ridge, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. That's where the German front line would have been. Over here, kind of where these trees are in the background behind me over here, this is where the British front line would have been and it would have run across kind of over behind us in a second. We're going to go check that out in just a minute. In between the two, right here, we have Sunken Lane. So this is Sunken Lane right here behind me and we're going to talk about Sunken Lane in just a minute as well. Now the gap that the British troops had to cross here on the first day of the Battle of the Somme was quite wide. You might remember in our video at Serre how close together those two lines were. Well here they're much further apart. So there was a strategic decision made by the British to try and take advantage of Sunken Lane. The plan would be to advance men forwards from the British front line into no man's land, into this little kind of valley here created by Sunken Lane that they could use so then the gap between there and the German front line was shorter for them to cross when the attack happened. Now another key strategy for the British on the first day of the Somme was to detonate mines along the German line. The idea of that would be to kind of weaken defences, take out strongholds where machine gunners were and things like that, and make it much easier, much less well defended for the British to cross. Here outside Beaumont Hamel, the 252nd Tunnelling Company of the Royal Engineers had dug a tunnel more than half a mile long, 60 foot underground, across and underneath the German front line. And that mine was going to be just at the top of the ridge here. So where those trees are, that's where the mine was. And it was packed with 40,000 pounds of explosives. The British general overseeing the attack here, a general by the name of Sir Almir Hunter Weston, he wanted the mine to be set off um, quite a bit before the British attack and he requested for it to be set off four hours before the attack. That request was denied because all mines were to be set off just before the British attack. The plan would be literally a couple of minutes before the attack, the mines would go off and then the British could attack across no man's land. In the end, the Hawthorne Ridge mine here was set off to go 10 minutes before the British would attack. Now that was going to be a few minutes before other mines along this line were to blow. And that decision, creating just that gap in between the explosion and the British attack, would actually prove to be deadly. And we're going to talk about that in just a little while as well. Now one of the unique things about the attack here uh, is that it was filmed. The mine explosion at Hawthorne Ridge was filmed. There was some action here in Sunken Lane that was filmed as well. A British cinematographer by the name of Geoffrey Mayland was here and filmed those things happen on the first day of the song. During the early hours of the morning on the 1st of July, men of the 1st Battalion Lancashire Fusiliers moved forwards from their front line into Sunken Lane, where we are right now. This is roughly the midway point, maybe not quite the midway, midway point, but roughly between where the British front line was and the German front lines behind me over here at Beaumont Hamel. And when the attack started, their job would be to move from here forwards and take the village of Beaumont Hamel itself. Now there is some famous footage where Geoffrey Mayland came forwards and joined those men here in Sunken Lane. This footage was filmed at about 6.30 in the morning, about an hour prior to the attack. Just over an hour later, a lot of the men filmed in that footage would be dead.
Wayland then moved further back in order that he could film the explosion of the mine being detonated. We're going to go head over there right now. Now I've come further back now to not quite to where the British front line would have been. It would have been slightly further back from where I am, but, but nearly to where it would have been. And somewhere around here, or at least in this area, is where Geoffrey Mayland would have filmed that famous footage of the mine exploding. That would have been just where these trees are up here. Those trees are actually now growing in the crater that has been left by that mine. And we're going to go check that out in just one minute. The mine was blown at 7.20 a.m. and men of the 2nd Battalion left their trenches over here, advancing across no man's land to take the ridge. So the mine blew and make no mistake, it had some effect. You can see behind me here, the crater. And look how enormous this is. Now I don't know if the camera is quite picking up how big it is, but to give you an idea, I mean, we're talking at least 30, 40 feet deep here, I would say, and huge, 200 yards across, maybe. Now, the problem was this mine blew at 720. The British were going to attack. The men of the 2nd Battalion would attack from their trenches over there across no man's land to take this area. But that 10 minutes proved fatal because whilst a lot of the Germans here were killed, not all of them were and it enabled men who had survived here and men from the reserve trench behind to move forwards and take the crest of this crater here and repel the attack from the 2nd Battalion. Ultimately, despite valiant efforts here, the attack was quickly repelled and by 7.30, only 10 minutes later, the Germans were able to be setting up machine guns here along this ridge. Now that would prove fatal because what you can see from here is the view that the German soldiers here would have had across no man's land, sunken lane, no man's land, and then the German front line over there. It would only be a minute or two before the men of the Lancashire Fusiliers left Sunken Lane to advance across this open space over the watchful eye of the German machine gunners right here. At 7.30 a.m. the 1st Battalion Lancashire Fusiliers emerged from Sunken Lane advancing towards Beaumont Hamill. Now the unique thing about Sunken Lane is that you can probably more than a lot of other places on the Somme, you can literally understand what these men went through. So we're here in Sunken Lane, they would have to advance forwards out of the lane, out here into no man's land. Now of course no man's land itself would have looked very different, it certainly wouldn't have had this much grass around. But here we are, out into no man's land, advancing towards Beaumont Hamel. Now the problem here you can see, because of the failure to be able to take the ridge where the crater had blown, not only did the British troops advancing from here face enemy fire from the German trenches to the right, you can also see up there on the ridge they were facing German fire from there as well, so they had machine gun fire from the side and also from the front ahead of us. The men here were just getting cut down and those who hadn't been killed had to start retreating back into Sunken Lane, which at this stage was becoming full of dead and wounded men. By lunchtime here, the fight over just this short piece of ground uh, was com complete. It had been completely repelled with the British retreating back to their own front line. The Lancashire Fusiliers had lost 163 men with a further 312 wounded. And this stretch of the Somme was another example of just absolute failure, absolute tragedy. Despite the, the bravery of these men to advance across this open ground with machine gun fire ahead of them, machine gun fire to the right, they weren't successful. And it's another example of the tragedy here on the first day of the song.
The first day of the Battle of the Somme is always viewed as being a tremendous failure. And, and frankly, it, it was. <laughs> the, the, the tremendous loss of life is, is just unthinkable. But there were some sections of the British front where on the first day of the Somme, there was success. And we're in one of those places today. We are just southeast of Mametz, and this is where the 22nd Manchester's attacked from on the first day of the Somme. Where we are right now, these fields in front of us, with Mametz in this direction over here. This section of the front line was commanded by Lieutenant General Horn. His force consisted of the 7th and 21st Divisions here along this section of the front line. Facing them was six battalions of the German 28th Reserve Division. In the lead up to the battle here, before the big push, Captain Charlie May of the 22nd Manchesters wrote in his diary. He wrote, But it is the thought that we may be cut off from each other, which is so terrible, that our babe may grow up without my knowing her and without her knowing me. It is difficult to face and I know your life without me would be a dull blank. Yet you must never let it become wholly so. For you to be left with the greatest challenge in all the world, the upbringing of our baby. God bless that child, she is the hope of life to me. My darling, au revoir. It may be that you will only have to read these lines as ones of passing interest. On the other hand, they may well be my last message to you. If they are, know through all our life that I loved you and baby with all my heart and soul, that you two sweet things were just all the world to me. I pray God I may do my duty, for I know, whatever that may entail, you would not have it otherwise. Now, whilst the actual trench lines don't remain today, roughly where I'm stood, or at least slightly further up the road here, is where the 22nd Manchesters were due to attack from on the first day of the Somme. Their objective was to catch the German frontline trench. That was called the Bulgar Trench. That would have just been out here in these fields ahead of us. From there, they had a further objective to attack Cemetery Trench, which there was the reserve trench. And then from there, they would move into their final trench, which was the Danzig Alley Communication Trench, further up the hill behind me here, towards the edge of Mametz. As with most sections along the front line of the Somme, the attack here was going to start with an artillery bombardment of the German front lines. One of the main differences here was that that artillery bombardment was largely successful and had nearly obliterated the German artillery. Early morning, the 1st of July, the first day of the Somme, Charlie May wrote in his diary again. It was a glorious morning and now broad daylight. We go over in two hours time. It seems a long time to wait and I think whatever happens we shall all feel relieved once the line is launched. No man's land is a tangled desert. Unless one could see it one cannot imagine what a terrible state of disorder it is in. Our gunnery has wrecked that and its frontline trench is all right but we do not yet seem to have stopped his machine guns. These are popping off all along the parapet as I write. I trust they will not claim too many of our lads before the day is over. So Charlie May has, has referenced there the artillery bombardment. Now, of course, this area that would have been no man's land behind us is lush, green and farmland right now. It would have looked very different from this in 1916. This would have really been a wasteland of artillery craters and, and barbed wire and, of course, mass death and destruction. Now, the thing that concerned Charlie May was absolutely the problem, was that although the artillery bombardment had been hammering those German front lines, he could still hear the machine gun fire and they they knew the guys from the 22nd Manchester's knew that when they went over the top they would be walking into that machine gun fire at 7 30 a.m captain Charlie May led his 22nd Manchester's out of their frontline trench which would have been probably along this road here behind me and they would have advanced up this hill across these fields right here now the 22nd Manchester's crossed no man's land behind a creeping barrage and this was going to prove to be really successful because they advanced behind that barrage and they actually managed to drop down into the Bulgar German frontline trench and capture their first objective with relative ease. 
From there, they pushed onto the secondary trench called Cemetery Trench. And actually, they took that as well. But it was at this point that they started to come under fairly heavy machine gun fire from the Danzig Alley communication trench in the German reserve line. Now the problem here was that where they were getting bogged down, they were falling behind that creeping barrage, which had then pushed on to the further objective, leaving a lot of those German defences in Danzig Alley still live and active and firing at the 22nd Manchesters. The fighting between Cemetery Trench and Danzig Alley Trench raged back and forth for hours, but at about 4pm, the 22nd Manchesters pushed forward and managed to capture Danzig Alley itself. Now from here, we're gonna move up to where Danzig Alley Trench was. So I've just moved up um, to the other side of those fields now. Now where we were was across these fields here behind me. You can kind of see sort of in the distance there's a barn. Well that's roughly where we were, a little bit past that. So that is where the 22nd Manchester's attacked from and this is where they took their final objective at Danzig Alley. So I'm now sat in the Danzig Alley Cemetery. Uh, the cemetery here um, is pretty much on the spot where the Danzig Alley Trench was. So the 22nd Manchesters took their objective, success on the first day of the Somme. But at what cost? Of the 820 men with the 22nd Manchesters who went over the top just that short distance away, 472 of them were killed, wounded or missing. Later that evening, on the 1st of July, Captain Charlie May's body was found just outside Danzig Alley Trench. And here we are in Danzig Alley Cemetery, the final resting place of Captain Charlie May. Killed here on the 1st of July 1916 with the brave attempt with the 22nd Manchesters where they captured all of their objectives. Today we're outside Serre in northern France, a place that saw uh, some tremendous fighting on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Horace Isles was 16 years old when he died in the first 30 minutes of the Battle of the Somme, and today we're going to tell his story. Private Horace Isles was only 14 years old when the First World War broke out in 1914 and he lied about his age so that he could join the Leeds Pals. Became part of the 31st Division, along with two Bradford Pals battalions, the 15th Battalion West Yorkshire Regiment. Horace and his Leeds Pals arrived at the Somme in 1916 and on the 22nd of May he was wounded in the trenches and he was given seven days leave when he went home. That was going to be the last time his family saw him. When he was home, Horace's family tried hard to convince him to tell the authorities his real age, knowing that they would have to then send him home. But Horace didn't want to let down his friends. He didn't want to let down his Leeds pals. And so he returned here to the front, just in time for the big push of the Somme. For the Leeds pals, the Battle of the Somme would start here at Serre.
now right now i'm actually stood in what was the front line british trenches now this particular piece of stretch here uh, was actually where the 12th and 13th regiments went from this is where the quite famous accrington pals would uh, have left their trench from right here in front of me horace actually left his trench with the lead pals further down to my right hand side so slightly kind of almost south uh, sort of west from where we are right now and we'll walk down there in just a minute but their objective was to capture the hilltop fortress of Serre. Now you can see out here behind me, this ridge here and going up this hill was towards Serre. Okay, so we've walked a little bit up um, further to the right hand side of where we were and roughly here, roughly along the edge of this road line is where the frontline trenches would have been, where Horace and his Leeds pals would have advanced out of this trench and across this field towards Serre. Serre is kind of there, you can just roughly see farm buildings. That's where they would have advanced out from here across the field there. Now the regiments here didn't have to advance far from the front line of the trench right here. The German trench line was pretty much just the other side of where you can see this cemetery, so they did not have hugely far to advance. It was meant to be a swift and decisive attack, but it ended up being one of the most deadly battles in human history. And the Leeds Pals, along with several other regiments here, were one of those battalions that was nearly completely wiped out. The men here had been told that after days of artillery bombardment on the German lines, the defences would be almost non-existent and that they would be able to advance out of these trenches and walk forwards and take the German front lines. But in reality, the Germans had been hidden deep down in, in deep dugouts and had avoided that artillery bombardment. As soon as it stopped, they came out, manned their machine guns and manned their defences. At 7 a.m. the officers' whistles went and the first row went over the top. The Accrington Pals went first from these trenches right here, heading out towards Serre. They were cut to pieces. At 7.20, the whistles went once more and Horace and his Leeds pals left their trenches from over here to our right-hand side, advancing towards Serre. Facing machine gun fire, mortar fire, artillery bombardment, men were just getting cut down left, right and centre. Some hit as soon as they left their frontline trenches. So I'm just walking out now from the British front line. As I said, the Accrington Pals left their trenches here behind us and the Leeds Pals and Horace left just over here to my right hand side, advancing here towards the German lines. Okay, so I've advanced forwards now and you can see I'm not that far out from where that front line trench was. Horace would have attacked from here across this field with his Leeds pals. And where I'm stood right now, really only a few hundred yards out into no man's land, this was about as far as most of the men got in the first 10 minutes of the battle here. Nearly half of the Leeds pals had been killed along with Horace Isles. At the end of that terrible day, only 47 of the 650 Leeds pals that went over the top had survived, the rest either wounded, killed or missing. Eight days later, on the 9th of July, not knowing Horace's fate, his sister wrote a letter to him. And I've got that letter right here. I'm going to read it now. We did hear that they're fetching all back from France under 19. For goodness sake, Horace, tell them how old you are. I'm sure they'll send you back if they know you're only 16. You've seen quite enough now. Just chuck it up and try to get back. You won't fare no worse for it. If you don't do it now, you'll come back in bits and we want the whole of you. It was too late. Horace was already dead and Florrie's letter was returned unopened, marked on the front, killed in action. That's how Florrie found out that her 16 year old brother had been killed here at the Somme with a letter returned marked killed in action on the front. Now, before we finish this story, we've got one more place to visit, which is just about five or six minutes walk from here.
So here we are at the Sair Number no. 1 Cemetery, the final resting place of Private Torres Isles. Now there's, there's an awful lot of men in this cemetery who, who were killed in the Great War, but it doesn't feel right calling Horace Isles a man. It's, this, this was a boy, a, a child, who was killed in, in the horrors of this war, and it just shows you the, the, the tragedy of what went on here. Horace Isles, West Yorkshire Regiment, killed 1st of July, 1916. Cyril Jose was 16 years old when he attacked here at Overlers with the 2nd Devons on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. He went over the top at 7.30am. By 7.35am he was laying wounded in no man's land just here. But his story didn't end there and we're going to tell that story today. So on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, Cyril Jose was here at Ovillers with the second Devons and their objective would be to attack the village of Ovillers which is here behind me just on the other side of the cemetery. The British frontline trench was out here behind us, literally on the ridge in the background here. This is where the frontline British trench was and Cyril would be attacking across this open ground on the first day of the song. He left his trench at 7.30 a.m. Now, Cyril Jose has recorded his story since the Great War, and we're lucky to have some of that written down, and I'm going to share his account of initially going over the top right now. So here's what Cyril had to say. We went over the top at 7.30 a.m., the first wave of troops. The German infantry occupied deep dugouts and had survived the devastation wrought by our artillery. At that distance, we had no possible chance of surprising them. They simply cut us down with their rifle and machine gun fire. Their artillery had already set a barrage across no man's land. Men went down like corn before a scythe. So despite the machine gun fire and artillery against the second Devons, Cyril bravely marched across no man's land in this vast open space behind me. He got nearly to the German barbed wire just in front of the German trench, which would have been just about level with this wall on the edge of the cemetery here behind me. Let's listen to his story of what happened next. We were a sorry remnant that reached the Jerry barbed wire a special 24-hour trench mortar bombardment on the wire entanglements had only succeeded in making a few gaps. Naturally, Jerry had his machine guns and rifles trained on these. Down went 2nd Lieutenant Gould. Across him fell his batsman, Harry Hamblin. Both were killed instantly. I jumped to clear them. A bullet thumped through my left shoulder and chest, knocking me down. I panicked and yelled, I'm hit. So Cyril lay injured in no man's land, along with thousands of other men. Now the problem was the fighting would carry on here for hours over the next day or two. And so there wasn't an easy opportunity for Cyril to go back towards his own British line. Now, luckily, whilst he was injured, he was still able to move. So he had to lay as still as he possibly could here in no man's land, waiting for the opportunity to try and get back 
to the British lines. Now this situation that Cyril was in was not unusual and it was the problem here on the first day of the Somme. Lots of men lay wounded and bleeding in no man's land and then died from wounds that they maybe wouldn't have died from were they able to have received treatment earlier. Let's listen to Cyril's story again. Not until 7am on the 2nd of July, stiff and in pain, my uniform purple with blood, did I feel it safe to move. Slowly I began the long crawl back. The grass was fortunately long. It seemed that I was alone in a field of dead men. So 24 hours, Sewell will lay right here in no man's land behind us, waiting for his opportunity to crawl back across this open land towards the British frontline trench. As he mentioned, the grass here was longer at the time, and so very slowly he began to crawl inch by inch back across no man's land. You can imagine that the carnage that he was crawling back through, his friends lying dead around him. But as he started to get through his journey, he did bump in to one of his wounded colleagues who was not killed. I encountered Private Lammercraft, a hardened regular soldier, 35 years old. He was wounded in the back and legs. We struggled along together with my right arm under his body whilst he tried to walk on his hands, wheelbarrow style. It felt like in an hour we'd made little progress. We were both too weak from loss of blood. So at this point, the men decided the only opportunity for them to survive would be for Cyril to push on alone. Before he left, though, he collected uh, water bottles, canteens from, from other dead soldiers lying in no man's land, bravely trying to get them back to his friend Lammy so that he would at least have the best opportunity to survive in no man's land. That wasn't an easy task. Cyril at the time was getting sniped at by the German soldiers, machine gun fire who had seen him and other wounded men still crawling around in the devastation here that was no man's land. But Cyril pushed on back towards the British front line and eventually managed to get there. He flung himself into the British front line trench, straight away told them about his friend Lammy who was still lying out here in no man's land. But at the time it was too dangerous for anyone to attempt to try to get him. Private Lammercroft would actually lay for a further three days in no man's land, but he survived and he was rescued three days later, no doubt thanks to the brave efforts of Cyril to make sure he had water and everything he needed to survive that time out here in no man's land. Despite the wounds that Cyril suffered here on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, he survived. He would return to the front line after spending time in hospital in 1917 and would fight through the rest of the war. But he returned home to the West Country where he married a lady called Dorothy. He went on to have two children. By the time he died in 1984, he was 84 years old. He had two children, four grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Now, of course, not all of the men from the Second Devons were as lucky as Cyril, and a lot of them were killed here and still lay here today. For example, W. H. Strawbridge of the Devonshire Regiment, killed here 1st of July 1916, aged 21 years old. There's many men of the Devonshire Regiment here in the Overlairs Military Cemetery. A lot of those are are unknown soldiers, so there are graves here, um, you know, from the Devonshire Regiment, but marked as unknown soldiers. So probably from from where they recovered the bodies from, they knew where certain units had attacked from, so they knew they would have been a member of the Devonshires, um, but unfortunately they weren't able to identify them. Now there's other men here who, who are named again. So for example, we have here F.T. Oden. I hope I pronounced that correctly the Devonshire Regiment killed here 1st of July 1916, 20 years old.
today we're at the Devonshire Cemetery on the Somme. And this is where the 9th Devons would attack towards Mametz on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Now in our previous video um, that we did at Mametz about the uh, the Manchesters who attacked here, uh, that was just across, kind of slightly uh, sort of to the east of where we are over in this direction. And the front, front line ran literally across these fields here and then over to this area here where we are right now. And this cemetery is where the Devonshire's frontline trench would have been and we will talk about that in just a little bit. And this line of trees that kind of comes along in an L shape across here and then down here towards us, this area here was called Mansell Copse. Now across in front of us here in what would have been no man's land there is a big dip also known as the Carnoy Valley and that ran across to where the German front line was. So the German front line would have been across on the other side of the dip and we're going to go have a look at that in just a minute and would run across and up the hill here towards Mametz. So a key feature of the land here is that in between here the front line trench where the Devons attacked from and the German front line trench is there was a big valley and a big dip that the British troops here would have to cross in the attack on the first day of the Somme. So I've just come down um, slightly to give you an idea of the land here. So behind me, um, this is Mansell Copse and the uh, the British line ran across here um, and pretty much kind of up, uh, I don't know if you guys can see that building like over in this direction, we're just over kind of here. That's where we were when we talked about the Manchester's attack here at Mametz. And the German front line ran across over here, just on the other side of this valley here. Here in the Devonshire Cemetery, all but two of the men here were members of either the 8th or 9th Devonshires, uh, and all but three of those were killed here on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. One of the 163 men buried here is Captain Duncan Martin. Now he would lead a company of the 9th Devons in the attack here at Mametz. But earlier in the year, uh, in May, when he was on leave, uh, he famously created a plasticine model of the land that he had seen here. It was almost like a, a way of kind of planning out the attack and, and mapping the, the land in a 3D form uh, to kind of almost play out uh, how it would happen. And he, he did that model of the land right here. And it raised him to have a couple of fairly major concerns. Looking at the lay of the land, Captain Martin was concerned about one machine gun in particular, positioned at a place called the Shrine. He was worried about the angle that that had across the front line of the British, across on the other side of the valley. That meant that that German machine gunner would have a huge view across the open space that the British troops would have to cross, and he described this area as a danger zone, where he thought there'd be a lot of casualties. So we've stepped forwards now, just beyond Mansell Copse. This is Mansell Copse behind me. So this is where the men would have advanced out from. Beyond Mansell Copse, you can see this huge patch of open ground. And then up this ridge behind me here is where they would have had to advance. Now, Captain Martin had talked about the guns. Well, he was right. One of the key machine guns that he believed was positioned at an area called the Shrine, which is just over here. It's these buildings behind me. There were other machine guns positioned on these ridges beyond us right here. So this really did make this area a, a very, very dangerous spot to cross, wide open, and the Germans would have seen them coming from, from so far away. So we've just moved across um, a bit here. So this is the area um, that was called the Shrine. This corner behind me here um, is the corner of the cemetery where the Germans had a, um, a fairly well-built machine gun position. And when you come here and you look across the land here, I mean, the view 
that they had was just absolutely commanding. When you look back across to Mansell Copse in this direction here, the view that they would have had of the Devons crossing this open space. Now, although this is the gun that Martin specifically had expressed concern about, this wasn't the only gun. If you look across beyond me here, so so just to confirm again, so Mansell Copse is over in this direction, they would cross this valley here. Now this ridge up here behind me, the German trenches ran across in this direction and there were machine guns positioned up there as well. So not only did this gun here have a huge view across this open space, those guns up there did as well. And then the German trenches of course carried on this direction, and again here, bearing in mind that the Devons attacked three minutes before the other sections of this frontline trench. So when the Devons first crossed that open mound ahead of us there, there weren't troops crossing this ground in front of these German trenches. So it's just as likely that the guys here would have had an opportunity to fire across to the right at those guys crossing before they had attacks coming at them head on. When you, when you see the view here that this German gunner had, oh my goodness. No wonder so many of the men of the 8th and 9th Devons were killed here. Now this area here being such a prominent section uh, of the British frontline trench, it meant that the Germans quite frequently um, put down artillery fire on this area. So prior to the Battle of the Somme on the first day, uh, the order was actually made for the Devons to leave this frontline trench and move into their reserve trench a little bit further back across the field. With that in mind, it meant that their attack would actually start three minutes earlier than the other sections along the front line here, and the Devons would leave their reserve trench at 7.27 a.m. as opposed to 7.30 that a lot of the attack here was set for, and they would move across this field towards Mansell Copse and then on from here to attack the German front line. So we've just come a little further back and it's, it's very windy, so I hope you guys can hear me okay. But the other side of this field behind me is where that, where that reserve trench was. So that meant that the men who left that trench at 727 had to cross this field and this land behind me over the top of this mound right here. And you can see from where we are and hence the wind that's up here, we are so exposed. The German front lines in this direction would have had a clean look at these guys once they got to the top of this mound. The German front lines in this direction would have been able to see these guys. And the problem was that hundreds of these men were hit and killed uh, or wounded before they had even got back as far as their own front line at Mansell Copse. And one of the men killed in this area here was Captain Martin maybe killed by machine gun fire just as he'd predicted or maybe killed by rifle fire from one of the other trenches either ahead of him or to his right but he was killed just here before he even got back as far as his own frontline trench Another man buried in the cemetery here is Lieutenant William Noel Hodgson. He's from Gloucestershire and he studied at Durham and Oxford before coming here as part of the Devons at the Battle of the Somme. He was only 23 years old when he was killed here on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Hodgson was a writer and a poet and quite famously on the 30th of June 1916 he wrote a poem called Before Action. Now it's widely believed that that poem uh, was almost written as a premonition of his death and I'm going to read an excerpt of that poem now. I that on my familiar hill saw with uncomprehending eyes a hundred of thy sunsets spill their fresh and sanguine sacrifice ere the sun swings his noonday sword must say goodbye to all of this by all delights that I shall miss help me to die O Lord 
Now, as I said, it's believed that Hodgson wrote that poem with knowledge of where the German guns were and knowing that he would be leaving this trench to cross no man's land. And that poem was written two days before Hodgson was killed here at the Battle of the Somme. Now the second wave of men here included Lieutenant Hodgson. Now he was leading um, a bomber's squad, so those guys would carry um, like grenades and bombs and as they got near the frontline trenches of the Germans they could take out key positions or maybe if they got into the trenches they could take out dugouts using these bombs, things like that. Well he advanced forwards, he did get back to their original front line and pushed on from there. So Lieutenant Hodgson got beyond Mansell Copse and it's believed he only got a short way across this open patch of land here before he was shot in the neck and he died. He was killed somewhere in this area just beyond Mansell Copse, only a few minutes into the attack here at the Somme. Now the 9th Devons here were supported by the 8th Devons attacking behind them and despite the, these incredibly hard conditions they did gradually start to work their way towards their objectives and incredibly despite losses by 4.30 in the afternoon the Devons had reached their objectives here in the German trenches towards Mametz. The 8th and 9th Devons who attacked here, mostly volunteers, went into battle with more than 1,500 men on the first day of the Somme. By the end of that first day, more than 400 of them were wounded, 62 were missing, and 236 of them were dead. Three days after the attack, Reverend Ernest Cross organised a group of stretcher barriers to move out here into no man's land to collect the casualties, um, the bodies of those who had been killed. Now, of course, quite often um, in, in battle, men were buried uh, right near where that attack happened, often in places like shell holes or areas just behind the front line. And uh, Reverend Cross uh, brought those men um, here to the frontline trench um, that they had been in and the trenches that they had attacked from across no man's land on the first day of that song. And he buried those men here in that trench and that's where they lie in these graves behind me today. Now as you walk up the steps here, um, just before you go through the gate of the cemetery, there is a plaque here and it reads, The Devonshires held this trench, the Devonshires hold it still. To the 8th and 9th Devons who attacked here on the 1st of July 1916. Today we're at the Thiepville Memorial here on the Somme and the memorial here has engraved the names of more than 72,000 men who were lost in the battles here in the Somme area between July 1915 and March 1918. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission states that 90% of the men who are named on this memorial were killed in the first Battle of the Somme from the 1st of July to the 18th of November 1916. And the special thing about the memorial here is that it is reserved for those who are missing or unidentified and whose bodies were never recovered. They have no known grave who were lost here in the Somme region during the Great War.
So when you come in to the memorial here, the first thing you can see, well, no, look, the first thing you can see is just the walls and walls of men who were named on this memorial. And it, it really, it really hits you hard when you walk in here. I mean, I was at the Menin Gate Memorial actually just yesterday and you get a feeling there, but you, you really get a feeling here. And I think some of this video might be quite hard to make, but I'm gonna try and do the best I can to honor the guys here. So the first thing you see is up on the, the top inscription, kind of up high, and I'll, I'll give you guys a close in shot of it so you can see. Um, it says, here are recorded the names of officers and men of the British armies who fell on the Somme battlefields July 1915 to February 1918, but to whom the fortune of war denied the known and honored burial given to their comrades in death. So that's what this memorial is about, right? To go people who had no known grave, who were lost at battle, or maybe whose bodies were recovered, but weren't identified, in which case they would lay in many of the cemeteries around this area, uh, marked as an unknown soldier. For all of those unknown soldiers' graves in the cemeteries around the Somme here, their name will appear here on this memorial. Now, when you walk around here, um, this memorial has 16 uh, wreaths on each of the pillars. Uh, and those are the names of the various battles that made up the battles of the Somme. And so, for example, I can see up here, we have Somme 1916. So that is the first battle of the Somme. Uh, we have the Battle of Albert, uh, the Battle of Poziers Wood, uh, the Battle of Thiepval Ridge, just near here, uh, and all the different battles that make up the battles of the Somme. Now, as I said, this memorial has more than 72,000 names. And unfortunately, and I wish I could, I can't recognize every single one of those men uh, in this video right now, because it would be a, a multiple hour video. Um, but what I can do is recognize a few of them. Uh, you know, I'm gonna read a few of the names r r right now. We have men here on the memorial, like, G.M. Benbow, G.F. Black, J.H. Blaver, or Blaver, E.V. Bolton, and many, many more on this memorial. And I've looked into the story of a few of the men here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of the guys that we have here on this memorial at Thiepval. first person I'm going to talk to you about is a guy by the name of John Abbott King. John Abbott King was an English rugby player and he had 12 caps for England. He fought here at the Somme as part of the King's Liverpool Regiment and he was killed at the Battle of the Somme in August 1916. He is one of the many missing whose bodies weren't recovered, recorded here at the Thieval Memorial. So the next person we're gonna talk about is Eric Norman Franklin Bell. And you'll notice that he has a VC next to his name here on the memorial. And that designates that he is a winner of the Victoria Cross. Captain Eric Norman Franklin Bell was a member of the Inniskilling Fusiliers and on the opening day of the Battle of the Somme here, uh, his unit was attacking a German machine gun position uh, not far from here at Thiepval. During that attack, he crept forwards uh, and single-handedly with a grenade took out that German machine gun position so that his troops could advance. From there, he went on with a further three acts of similar bravery during that attack until he was sadly killed. 
Unfortunately, his body wasn't recovered and he is remembered here on the Thiepval Memorial. When you come to a place like this and you're you're walking around and you see all these names, I mean there's there's just like name after name and the wall after wall of names. I mean just look look, just look down here behind me. Every single wall here is thousands of names. And this is just one section, there's section after section. And when if you were to lose somebody. In, in that kind of situation when they're away from you at war that would be horrible enough right to then not not know like not not have a grave not to to be a hundred percent sure that, that they had been killed there'd be that awful hope like maybe they hadn't and at what point do you do you come to terms with the fact that you're not going to see them again i Yeah, this place. It's a tough place to be. Don't know if I can say that I hope you enjoyed this video, but I hope you I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it useful and that you learned a little bit more about the Thiepval Memorial like I certainly did today. Thank you for watching.